Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 35. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. This is a podcast about the craft of knitting and the people who practice that craft. Yes. And we're really happy to introduce you to Nancy Machant today in today's interview. Nancy is probably the world authority on the brioche technique. She's already written three books on the, on the technique and she still thinks that the brioche stitch is way underdeveloped compared to other knitting techniques. We're going to meet Bebel from Germany as our guest in Knitters of the World. Bebel creates the most beautiful and colourful stranded colour work designs. And Ella Gordon from Shetland is going to talk about her latest design and new releases. Now, because we're starting a brioche carl, I've prepared a really quick tutorial for you on the basic brioche stitches. Yep, and I am doing two colour brioche now. Yes. That's my latest project. We'll get to that shortly. Andrea is working on fitting issues once again <laughs> with her latest knitted garment project. So we have a really lovely full program coming up. Sit back, grab your knitting and enjoy it. Yes. We are starting with Bring and Brag and featuring my brioche hat, which yes. is complete, which we need to talk about. <laughs> Yay. So... In the last episode, Andrea explained that she had not actually done any brioche knitting and she had to teach herself to knit. And about 20 minutes later, to knit the basic brioche stitches, yeah. knit and purl. And then she taught me very quickly. And uh, then she made up a pattern and then I started work. <laughs> so this is the result of all that, that endeavour. Um, it's a 88 stitches cast on here and then a one by one rib for the brim, nice long brim so that Andrea can fold it up the way she likes to, make a nice snuggly hat. And then I got onto my real brioche knit and pearl. I won't go into the details of that, Andrea will cover that shortly, but I did all of this beautiful brioche knit and pearl work here with only a few interesting features along the way. Um, and... Then we have to explain how this hat got finished because whilst I was doing this, Andrea was looking up how to do a decrease in brioche so that we could get this hat finished and get around the yeah, corner. And so it could have a dome on the top of a it. A crown, yeah, <laughs> and not just like a, a sort of tubey thing on your head. So I went to bed having done my part and I woke up in the morning and it was all finished. Yeah. Just like that. How did that happen, Andrea? Well, it's amazing that Aaron Waite yarn knits up so fast. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the Aran Weight, it's wool and vine yarn, and you can see the crown here, which I'm very happy with. It's just a simple spiral pattern, but I think it's worked out very successfully. Well, pretty successfully, because I did actually tell Andrew to cast on too many stitches. We had 88, and that doesn't divide into six evenly, and I knew that I wanted to do a six section crown. So we had four stitches too many. Mm. And... That just meant that two of my six sections are slightly larger, but I don't think optically you can really see that, so I still call it a successful project. Yeah, I think it's still going to work as a hat. Absolutely. So all that is is a basic brioche decrease to the right, right leaning, and that's what creates this lovely spiral effect, which I think is pretty, and it's, and it's reasonably sim uh, simple. I was teaching myself how to do it, um, as I was going. So that's why I did the crown and Andrew didn't. <laughs> and especially because if you do a mistake, and it was highly likely that you'll do a mistake if you're teaching yourself a new technique up here, I didn't want Andrew to do it and then me to have to fix it up because it's a little trickier <laughs> on brioche. But it's a yep. successful hat. I've got some pictures up here of Madeline wearing it. Um, because it's so big and the brioche stitch is so stretchy, you can either wear it slouchy, which perhaps looks a little bit more stylish, or you can wear it in my favourite way of wearing a hat, which is just close around my head and the brim turned up so it's double thickness around my ears so the wind doesn't get in my ears when I'm out hiking. So it's really successful. It's going to be a good thing for the next German winter. Yeah, and Andrew did such a good job on one colour brioche. Yeah. So, so moving on to uh, under construction, this is my next brioche project. And as you can see, and as I mentioned, I've moved on to two colour, um, which is actually not much of a step from one colour brioche once or when you're working in the round. I think it's a little bit different if you're working in the flat. I still Sounds think moving from one colour brioche to two colour brioche is easier than moving from one colour knitting to stranded or feral knitting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so. It, it wasn't really difficult. The one challenge I still have is with going around the corners, doing it again with Magic Loop. 
Um, and I just find it a little bit confusing because you need to know if you've wrapped it and all that. Yeah. And with the two colours, that's a little bit extra confusing there, so I do occasionally get some help and some quality control. Unfortunately, because I don't there. really knit hats, we didn't have any 40 centimetre or 16 inch um, circular needles. So yeah. poor Andrew had to learn Somebody to... Somebody said I was poor. <laughs> get poor Andrew got Andrew. the right amount of sympathy from some viewers. <laughs> and so... That he was learning to brioche at the same time as magic looping. So he did jump in the deep end and do it very well, but then because I was feeling rather guilty, I did buy him a pair yeah. of 40 mm. uh, centimetre needles. Here they are. Yeah. And I gave it a go, but I actually ended up rejecting them. Yeah. Um, because I can see I can see it does get around the problem that I've got, so just figuring out exactly what to do at these bits here. Um, but I just found them awkward to work with. You think it's possibly because the needles are quite short. I That wasn't my feeling. I found that they were quite sluggish in the wool. I mean, this is a... Because it's, 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 it it's, it's not slippery like metal. Yeah, they're yeah. wood and these are, these are metal. This is a, um, a ferrule yarn, really. Yeah. Um, so it's probably it's a, a little bit grabby. Yeah, woolen um, And the other thing is it's just because it's short, you can't sort of pull a needle in and out as easily. You haven't sort of got this free room here to move the needle around, which I somehow like to do. So I've gone back to the, the magic loop. Yeah. Um, just looking at the yarn here, it is the Hebridean 3-ply from Virtual Yarns. This is leftover yarn from Andrea's last Virtual Yarns or Alistarmore project, which is the... Catherine Parr, which Andrea knitted for Madeline. Um, absolutely beautiful. I think it's a stunning design. Yeah. So this is going to be a really nice matchy-matchy hat for <laughs> Madeline and she'll be very well fitted out. Um, I did realise she's going to be in Australia over winter. So I'll wear this hat while she's away. <laughs> you wear. Shh. What about the jumper? I might wear the jumper too. You'll be in trouble. I'll be in big trouble yeah, if I wear just her in case, Just in case Madeline watches uh, yes. the episode, then you'll be in trouble. So okay. so it's my new yarn, project. Yeah, this yarn is a DK weight yarn. It's You said it was the three-ply, Hebridean, Hebridean three-ply. Three ply. Yeah, yeah, so it's a bit finer. It's going to go a little bit more slowly, but it's still a hat and it's not a, it's not a jumper like that. So I think I'll manage it. Yeah. I'm curious to see who does the... Um, the decreasing in this project. And You'll do the decreasing. I'll do the decreasing, yeah. right. Yeah, and we've been putting in lifelines. Yeah. yeah. So well done, Dals. Yeah, well done, Dals. So we started a brioche carl, which started on the 1st of August, and I want to encourage you to try the brioche stitch if you haven't. So I'm a pretty experienced knitter, but I've only just taught myself the brioche knit stitch and the brioche pearl stitch. And I think even though that brioche knitting really is in vogue at the moment, and there's a lot of gorgeous designs out there, there still are quite a few knitters, both experienced and inexperienced, who haven't yet tried the brioche stitch. Yeah, so we want to invite you, if you haven't tried it, if you haven't done any brioche knitting, Give it a go and come and join the cowl. Absolutely. Keep me company. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to give it a, make it a really long cowl so that you're going to have time to try out the stitch first of all, if you haven't before, on either a swatch or a very simple project like a simple hat or a simple cowl. And then if you're more experienced or if you're feeling confident, to sink your teeth into one of the amazing out-of-this-world pieces of artwork. <laughs> designs that are out there and I've got to encourage all of you you've got to stick around and watch this interview with Nancy because her designs are out of this world gorgeous and yep. complex so I'm going to give you a lot of time so I, I certainly don't want you to be worried about deadlines so that the moral of this story is be ambitious and don't worry about deadlines <laughs> so <it laughs> because does. If at the end of November there are some designs in there that are out of this world complex and you just simply need more time, I'm really happily going to extend the deadline, yeah? Yeah. And to encourage those of you who haven't tried the brioche knit and pearl stitch, I've prepared a very short tutorial on the brioche knit stitch and the brioche pearl stitch just to show you that it's very do doable. So stay tuned. It's a short tutorial and straight after that, Ella Gordon from Shetland is going to introduce you to her latest gorgeous design.
I'm going to show you the brioche stitch in one color. I think that is the easiest way to be introduced to the stitch and once you understand how it works in one color, it's pretty easy to start using two colors. So the brioche stitch pattern looks a little bit like a one by one rib, but the fabric it creates is thicker and springier than a one by one rib. Because the brioche stitch creates a loose, stretchy fabric, it's a good idea to go down a needle size or two so the finished fabric will hold its shape better. So I'm using an Aran weight yarn and I'm using a four millimeter needle to go with it. Fixing mistakes in brioche is a lot more complicated than in plain knitting, so use a lifeline every couple of rows until you feel more confident. So I'm using dental floss, which I just thread through the hole in my circular needles here. And once it's thread through like that, you just knit with it and it carries the dental floss through the whole round and it sets up a lifeline for you. And I've done, you can see my lifeline there. That's the last time I've done it. And I do it every four rows or so, so that if you make a mistake, you can just rip back here and very easily put these stitches the correct way onto your needle. Working the brioche stitch in the round, like what I'm doing with Andrew's hat, is different to working brioche in the flat. If you work brioche in the flat, you'll only need to use the brioche knit stitch. When you work brioche in the round, you'll work the brioche pearl stitch on every second round. Every second stitch, you're going to be slipping and giving it a yarn over. And every stitch that you slip in basic brioche, you're going to slip it pearl wise. So I'm just going to start now and show you the first row. When I spread my knitting out a bit more, you can see that we've got these columns of, of knit stitches here. And in between is like a column of purl stitches. And the top of that column, there is a purl stitch. And at the top of the knit column, there is a knit stitch that has a wrap on it or a yarn over going right over the top of it. To do a brioche knit stitch, you're going to be knitting that stitch that looks like a knit stitch together with its yarn over. There's the knit stitch and it has its yarn over and I'm going to knit those two together. And that's a brioche knit or a bark stitch. Now I've got what looks like a purl stitch, so I'm going to slip it. But always you need to bring the yarn to the front. That's the very first thing. Slip the stitch purl wise and then I'm going to give it a yarn over which just means I bring the yarn to the back of the work and it's going to create a yarn over and then I'm up to a column of knit stitches and this knit stitch has got its own yarn over here and I have to knit those together and that just means I'm doing a brioche knit stitch. So I knit it together and you can see the act of knitting it together makes this, puts this yarn over on the purl stitch in place. So that's all that this row involves. I'm now going to bring the yarn to the front, slip purl wise, yarn over, brioche knit the next stitch. Yarn to the front, slip purl wise, brioche knit the next stitch. And you can see that I've now got yarn overs on all my purl columns. I'm on my second row now where I'll be brioche purling, but I want to first of all show you how uh, to read the knitting. So again, if you have a look at the columns, we've got columns of knit stitches here, and at the top of that column of knit stitches is a single knit stitch on the needle. In between what looks like the columns of purl stitches, there's a purl stitch on the needle, and it has a wrap over it, a yarn over over it. You can see that every second stitch. That tells you that we have to purl it with its yarn over and we have to brioche purl on this row. So here we go, the first stitch is a knit stitch. We need to have the yarn at the front of the work, which we've got. We slip the knit stitch purl wise and then we're gonna wrap it and we have to wrap it right around underneath the needle and have the yarn back at the front again. And we're going to brioche purl this purl stitch. That just means purling the purl stitch together with its yarn over. 
So yarn to the front, slip purlwise, give it a yarn over, brioche purl the next stitch or burp. Yarns at the front, slip purlwise, give it a yarn over, brioche purl or burp the next stitch. So I've shown you how to do the brioche knit stitch and the brioche purl stitch. You only need those two stitches to do a lot of patterns that are in simple one color brioche and two color brioche is just still using those two stitches but working with two colors. I'm Ella Gordon and this is my latest design which is called the Vatsland jumper. Um, so it was inspired by um, Shetland lace but also combining a little bit of Shetland lace into a garment. So it's knit um, from the bottom up and you knit from here to the armholes and then you knit both your sleeves separately and then join them all together on one needle and then decrease as you go with the raglan yoke. Um, the lace portion can be can be knit either flat or in the round, it's up to you. Um, and then you carry on knitting in the round. And one thing I did was at the side, um, I kept two stitches which are mirrored from what was happening down in the lace portion, just knitting garter stitch up to the armholes. So I think that kind of keeps you entertained a little bit <laughs> while you're knitting this plain portion which can get a little bit boring. Um, the yarn I used uh, for the sample was Brooklyn Tweed Shelter which is a worsted weight yarn. Um, I used four colours, um, Hayloft, Sap, Snowbound and then Sweatshirt is the main um, kind of mid-grey colour. If you had, um, if you couldn't get Brooklyn Tweed Shelter um, which I know it's quite hard to get it in the UK. Um, you could use a heavy DK or if you had a, quite a light iron weight, I think that would work as well. Um, you would just need to swatch to make sure. The cuffs and the neck, there's no ribbon, so I just did garter stitch, which I think also helps kind of tie in with the kind of garter stitch texture of um, the lace portion. Um, I think it it makes a good pattern for if you haven't done a lot of garments, um, maybe if it was your first jumper or something, because the the arms are cropped and also so is the body. So, um, and it being done in slightly thicker yarn um, makes it quite quick, quite quick to knit up. Um, you could, of course, um, knit the sleeves longer or the body longer. Um, this, I just quite like the cropped lens and thought it would look quite effective. So, um, so that's the Vatsland jumper. Thank you Ella for showing us your gorgeous jumper. This pattern's already been successfully knitted a few times. We wanted to show you some examples of that because it's been knitted by a couple of our viewers. The first example here is Alex Pearson and she was a guest on Knitters of the World in a previous episode and her version is really gorgeous. She's used warm tones in the Dye Gilpin Lowland yarn and the main colour is Beech Nut. And here's another version with cooler colours using the recommended Brooklyn Tweed Shelter. And this is by Catherine, whose Ravelry name is Cat Smoke. And I really love the blue-green and the yellow-green contrast colours that she's used. Producing this program is now a full-time occupation for Andrea. We can continue this work thanks to the support from viewers who decide to become a patron. You can become a patron for the price of a couple of cups of coffee per month. So if you do value the show, then please do become a patron of the show to allow us to continue this work. Yeah, and as a special thank you, I've written up the pattern for this hat this simple brioche hat and I've made, well I'm in the process of making a filmed tutorial showing you all the steps of how to do it including how to do the decrease stitches for the crown and the pattern of the hat and the filmed tutorial will be available to our patrons in a couple of weeks to say thank you.
I'm going to show you my knitted project now. As you can see, I'm wearing it. It is the Manzanita Tea by Romy Hill from her new lace knitting book. And it's a gorgeous, simple, elegant design. It's, I'm using the recommended yarn, which is from the Fibre Company. It's Road to China Light, and it's a blend of baby alpaca, silk, camel, and cashmere. So it's a hugely luxurious yarn. That means I have to get the fit exactly right. So just the construction details, you start with the provisional cast on, and then you get straight into the lace section for the yoke. Then you get into the stockingette, you divide for the arms in the body and you continue down in the body so it's top down. Now the gauge that Romy gives you, Romy gives you is based on the stocking stitch gauge. So based on that I decided to do the 34 inch bust and I'm happy with the way the stocking stitch fits me. I think that's really good but I think the lace here isn't stretched out enough okay and even when it's blocked it's not gonna it's gonna still be too big Okay, I think it's going to look nicer if the, the lace section was stretched out like this. I forgot to say, when you finish the body, you then pick up the stitches here and do a cuff. So even though this is quite tight for me here because of the provisional cast on, the lace section kind of sits just over the shoulders like this and then you've got a nice sort of like a cuff here that you're doing smaller, a smaller a size. Well, can you do a cuff around the neck? A collar? I don't know. I a would collar. have thought it was a collar. Yeah. Okay, so I think my lace section is too big on this. So Andrew had the brilliant idea to knit the jumper again. That's in an the easy smaller, idea for me to have. Yeah, in the smaller size and then try them on and compare them. So that's what I did. I knitted it all again in the size... 31 inch so you've seen this is the larger size I'm going to take it off and put the other size on and show you what I've done so here I am with size 31 lace section on and I hope I'm not making a fool of myself and you can actually see that this lace section is more stretched out there's actually I don't know if you can see from here but there's these little peaks and in the 31 size there's two less of these sections than in the size that's bigger. So it definitely is smaller. And mm. I think once I get rid of this provisional cast on, you'll see that it's stretched out more. So what I wanted is I wanted the lace in the stitch count for size 31 and the stocking uh, stitch for the body in the stitch count for size 34. So it meant I had to increase but I wanted to do that as invisibly as possible. So I've increased on every little peak down here so that you can't see it. I didn't want you to see little bumps or, or marks in the body. And I think I've done that pretty successfully. I think it's probably very successful, Dales. You can't tell. Well, I can't tell, <laughs> no, but I'm not the best judge of these things. Anyway, so... After all, Andrew's suggestion was a good thing. I will now unpick the rest. I'll go with this one. So I've got size 31 lace and body in size 34. Very good. Yeah. My name is Babel Salet. I live with my family in Windhagen, a small town close to the Westerwald, 30 kilometers away from Bonn. I've been knitting since my childhood. My mother taught me how to knit at the age of 10, 12. There was lots of knitting going on in our house, as my two older sisters were practicing it was well. The sight of four knitting women at the same time made my dad state once, it looks like a knitting factory. <laughs> the first projects, our first hats, were sold on a school bazaar. It was only many years later I discovered that even back then I had already used the fair eye pattern without knowing the history and the techniques behind it. I simply enjoyed knitting in form of stocking knit stitch. Then I stopped knitting for a few years until I became a mother. 
18 years ago. I felt like taking it up again. I was soon looking for new challenge and inspiration in this sector, but in Germany there was only books for knitting beginners available. So one day I searched for the English word knitting in the internet and bam, there was tons of books, information, patterns, special offerings on this subject. First I took instruction from Alice Darmore, but soon I started to design my own pattern and color gradients, uh, finding my inspiration through nature, catalogs and in art. Last year I created four coats. I started off with springtime, two different green yellow noirs, which I bought at the knitting festival on Fahne. I know, seeing in my studio the questions comes to mind why I would need to purchase more wool. But that is the way um, we knitting the ladies are, just a little bit crazy. <laughs> a special eye catcher are the colorful Biesen. Sorry, I don't know the English word for it. I knit it on the borders here and on the sleeves and here. Um, I also underlined the decreasing A line here. Yeah. Uh, by including a Godet fold and a different pattern. Um, after springtime, I continue with summertime. Pretty colorful, just like summer itself. The color circle for the background features green and um, light blue. The circle for the pattern um, is a variety of pink, berry, orange and red. After finishing the first two seasons of the year, I had to continue with fall and winter time for a full year of sessional delights. Fall time. <laughs> I chose a background um, with 25 different Indian summer shades uh, for my fall time coat. The pattern color being um, a warm red, one color. This time I wanted to highlight the color by discussioning it from the sleeve pattern with a chessboard pattern. It creates a nice eye catcher again. And after fall time is winter time. I had this pattern in my hand many times before without knowing what to do with it exactly. However, holding my color selection for the winter coat in my hand, it was obvious how well the pattern would, uh, um, would work for winter. The color gradients are reverse to what I have done with my fall time coat. A dark petrol blue for the background and 25 shades of blue uh, for the pattern, including ice blue, um, light blue, uh, turquoise, zafir, agent, peacock and sea green. The glowing beason and um, the trachten schließen serving as eye catcher this time again. After finishing my wintertime coat, I felt like working on a shawl. That is when I created my flower series, 21 roses, here, um, my fire lily and tulip. Right now I have a new favorite. I'm busy knitting a stole. This spring I was inspired to create when I'm seeing a plum blossoming. The Bordeaux leaves going well with the light rose plum. The pattern is sampling like allium. In the moment I want to find a name uh, for the stole. Allium like the pattern or wild plum for the colors. The stitches for the stole I took from a professional cast on. The stole is knitting in rounds with stick here. Um, and I love using magic balls for knitting my projects. They are created by using small wads, like this, um, of each color one over the another. The created magic ball is amazingly colorful and I always eager to see how the different colors work for the background and the pattern. Knitting means the world to me. It feels like my escape from everyday life. I can out, live out my creativity and enjoy to play with colors. Andrea asked me what I could imagine for the future. And I would wish 
about writing a book, about my passion for color work knitting, explaining my philosophy about this handcraft and to share these with another knitters. Thank you, Babel, for your, showing us your gorgeous, gorgeous designs. As you saw in her studio, Babel's got over 240 different colours and she loves to put on workshops where she teaches people to plan out colour work projects and you can really slowly grade the colours both on the background with so many different colours. You can really do a lovely gradation on the background and then the same thing on a contrast colour, you can you can grade the, the motive colours. Yep. So that was really interesting to see. Uh, if you live in Germany or if you are travelling through and visiting Germany and you're up near Bonn, I think her studio is probably really worth a, vi a visit. And she does sell um, gradients of yarn so that you can go and you can pr plan a project and, and she'll put together some beautiful yarns for you that you can work with. Yep. So thanks a lot, Bebel. You can find the contact details at fruityknitting.com yeah. for this episode. Yeah. Yep. Um, we are next having the video collage that we made with some of the participants from our recent Fruity Lace Cal. The garments and shawls that are to be seen are beautiful and varied. And I must say, it's one of my favourite things to see everyone presenting their works. Um, so proud with what they've achieved and, and talking about it. So thank you very much to everyone who took the trouble to put that together to contribute their uh, little videos and enjoy this. Yeah, we love to celebrate your work. Yep. This is my Sellers um, wrap hap and it is knitted in John Arben knit by numbers and it's very very hot here today and I'm sort of looking forward to winter so I can actually wear it but I won't be wearing it yet. Hi I'm Colleen I'm C. Pieri on Ravelry I'm from Southern California and I knit with Aurukania Kopiopo yarn. I made the diamond lace poncho. I've knit lace before, but this is my first time to modify. And I like it. It turned out okay. Yeah, it fits. Hi, <laughs> this is Jessamy from St. Paul, Minnesota, USA. And this is Elizabeth. And we love to watch Fruity Knitting together. For the lace knit along, I chose Marie Wallen's uh, Anemone from her filigree collection. And I use Rowan yarn, cotton for the knit body and also for the uh, crocheted sleeves. I learned a lot. I learned how to do bus starts with this one and raglan sleeves. Mom, uh, I gotta make a movie. We're gonna make a movie. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. My name's Kimberly Penny and I'm from Michigan of the United States. It's so good to be talking to you. I love your podcast. I have just finished making my Good Vibes um, Lace Shaw, and it's by Nadia Creton, and I just love it. It's a merino and a little bit of nylon. It was a very easy shawl. Um, I hope you love it as much as I do. Thank you. Hi, my name's Vicky. This is my Fruity Knitting Lace Cowl piece. It's a Japanese stitch design cardigan by Hitomi Shida. I've taken it from this beautiful book from her Let's Knit series and I've made it from Color Mart Extra Fine Merino in red and edged it in the same yarn from Color Mart but in the orange color. 
Hello, I'm Rosie from Leamington Spa in Warwickshire. I have knit the Kate Davies North Marvin hat um, in the suggested two ply um, Jameson Smith colourways, and I absolutely love it. It's my first knit along, and it's been great at keeping me motivated. So, thank you very much. Hello, I am Radka from Czech Republic, and this is my Fukra by Gudrun Johnston. I knit it with Manos da Uruguay Fino. I am very happy with the result. Thank you, Andrew and Andrea, for this call. Hello everyone, I'm Nicola from Hannover and I knitted for the Fruity Knitting Lace Cobble a Into the Woods Owl Shawl. This is Lana Crossa Lace Seta in a burgundy color. It's alpaca and silk. So Madeline's joining us again really quickly for a quick sewing update. Last episode I showed you two jersey tops, the Agnes jersey top by Tilly and the Buttons that I sewed. Here's a picture. I'm wearing one version with straight sleeves and Madeline's wearing another one with puffed sleeves. And we also showed you some royal blue jersey fabric that we we're going to make into another puff sleeve jersey top for Madeline to go with this gorgeous skirt. So someone gave her this beautiful skirt and she hasn't really been able to wear it because she didn't have the right colored top. So that's the great thing about sewing. You can just go and get the material and make yourself a top. Mm -hmm. And so it, this works really well. I want to tell you quickly about this because it, it, it didn't work out exactly how I wanted it. There is a difference between different jersey fabrics. Some of them you can you can buy the same quantity and, and sew it the same way and one can be slightly bigger and slightly looser. Nevertheless, I think I did inadvertently a mistake with this one because the material itself is 150 centimeters wide and I bought a length of 150 centimeters wide. So it was pretty much like a square. And I always wash the material so that I get all the shrinkage over and done with before I cut out the pattern pieces. And so after I'd washed it, I found it hard to find the selvages and to know whether I was folding it lengthwise or widthwise. And I think in Jersey fabric, I'm still a learning sewer. <laughs> I'd say I'm an intermediate sewer, not quite a beginner, but not experienced. And I think the, the length wise is more it's got more stretch in it lengthwise than it has widthwise and I think I folded my material um, so that I had the stretch the most amount of stretch going in the widthwise because I sewed this up mm. in exactly the same size as the other previous two tops and it's like one size bigger so it should really be a size 36 European and I think it's turned out to be a 38. Size 38 so yeah. you can see like it's it's not tight tight fitting it still works right and it sort of slowly falls off the shoulders just a little bit but it, it still looks good anyway doesn't it yeah and it's very comfortable yeah so that was my sewing adventure I'm slowly learning things sometimes some fabric it's just really hard to see and especially dark fabric where the selvages are. But while you're here, you've been doing a bit more knitting. So quickly show us, we have to, we're running out of time. So just quickly show us, what have you done? Um, as you know, I have been working on my jumper, the Atlantic pattern by Sarah Hatton. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's knitted in four pieces from the bottom up and has raglan sleeves. And I've been using the Soft Jack DK yarn by Rowan in three yeah. different shades. This is the front there's another front or back piece. And then the two sleeves are finished as well. Yay. So you finished all the pieces. Yes. And next step now is something that I've never done before. It's sewing them all together. And then you're going to show me how to pick up some stitches yeah. around the collar. Or... Yeah. So I'll show you how to do just yeah. a good old fashioned back stitch to sew up all the seams. So you'll do that first. And then you mm -hmm. have to pick up 
um, use these stitches that are already on a stitch holder and pick up other stitches and just do a very short um, collar finishing. Yeah. Okay. So next time you're here, you'll be wearing it. I love planning and preparing our interviews and I've thoroughly enjoyed all of the interviews that we've done so far. But I'm particularly proud of this interview because Nancy is such a treasure to the knitting world. And she's got so much knowledge and expertise. You could really do a series of interviews on her. Yeah. So, yeah. Na I think this is a great interview. Nancy is totally passionate about her chosen area of the knitting world. Um, obviously a complete expert in that uh, field and is also a really lovely person. You can see that. You'll see that in the interview. So enjoy this. We'll be back in two weeks' time with the next episode. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you. Bye. Bye. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'm very excited to have Nancy Machant as my guest today. Nancy is probably the world authority on brioche knitting. Stephen West, sometimes called the king of brioche, credits Nancy with teaching him the brioche technique and defers to her expertise. Brioche creates a lovely, squishy fabric and is a relatively easy way to work with two colours. But Nancy says, unlike some other knitting techniques, Brioche has never really been developed to its full potential. Nancy has already written three books on the technique. She's clearly at the cutting edge of brioche experimentation with a fourth book in the pipeline. So it's wonderful to have such an expert on the podcast. Welcome, Nancy, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you, Andrea. It's really nice to be here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> So, Nancy, you're an American expat and you've been living in the Netherlands for a very long time. Can you briefly tell us how did you come to be living there and just describe briefly what's the knitting and handcrafting culture like? Well, I came to the Netherlands in the 70s. I, had, uh, I was finished with school. I taught. I was a school teacher for three years and I thought I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So I went to graduate school, and it was after graduate school in the 70s that I came to Amsterdam. And I originally came here just to stay for a month. And after a month, I mean, I found a little job. I found an apartment, and I thought, well, it's good on my resume if I stay here for a year. And after a year, I thought, well, you know, I'm speaking the language a little bit. I'll stay a little longer. And now it's been 40 years, and I have children here. and. I mean, I've lived here longer than I lived in America, so this will be my home for the rest of my life, I'm sure. Uh, as far as the Dutch knitting community goes, I mean, the Dutch have been, you know, solid knitters for a long, long, long time, for centuries. And back in the 1850s, for example, they had master knitters that were men. And when knitting machines came in, the men stopped knitting and the women started knitting. And even back then, the Dutch were very, very cautious with money. You know, they're known for being very frugal. And so they made knit, uh, they knitted sweaters that were just knits and pearls, no cables because that took too much wool. And even to this day, uh, Dutch knitters can be very cautious about spending money on knitting, but it's such a deep thing in their culture. I mean, their grandmothers did it. They learned it at school, you know, at men and women. And everybody needs knitted garments, so it's it's a popular thing here. I mean, people knit. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> so you've got lots of knitting friends. <laughs> lots, yes. So can you tell us a little bit of history on the brioche knitting and brioche technique and then follow that up with your first um, introduction to it? The first ever written 
pattern that I found with brioche in it is from Miss Watts, little, these little knitting books from the 1800s. The 1840s, she wrote this little book that women put in their pocket. You know, they used to have pockets under their skirts. She put that in her pocket, or people put it in their pocket. They pulled it out to read the instructions and things while they were visiting. And um, the brioche stitch got its name because families, English families in the 1840s, went to Tunisia, Morocco. They bought these huge cushions that looked like cake and brought them back to England with them. And these big cushions were called brioche. They were made with this stitch. The brioche stitch is, is how, that's how the brioche stitch got its name is because these cushions were made with that stitch. The brioche stitch has many, many names. I mean, it's, it's been called the shaker stitch, the fisherman's rib, uh, English rib, oriental rib. In all over Scandinavia and Eastern Europe, it's known as patent, patent stitch, strip, stick, whatever the word for knit or stitch is in those countries. And I mean, it, the brioche stitch is the English name for that stitch. Uh, in Spain and in um, France, it's known as the English rib. All of these names are referring to this one stitch. Now, I found this stitch. I, I worked as a graphic designer in various studios in Amsterdam. And I was working at a studio that had a beautiful view to the Kracht, the canal. And there was a young man that used to walk by my window at 11 o'clock every day. And he had on a two-color brioche sweater. And I was a knitter. This was in the 70s. So I was a knitter, and I would see that sweater every day. And I thought, you know, I have to go out and follow him because I need to figure out what that stitch is. And that's exactly what I did. I went out, and I had to visually memorize because I didn't have an iPhone, of course. And <laughs> I went home. I looked it up. And I found in Barbara G. Walker's books, the brioche stitch. And I couldn't understand what she was, how she was explaining to make this stitch. I just didn't understand her explanation at all. So I went to my local yarn shop and I asked Mimi, the owner of the local yarn shop, if she knew this stitch. And she said, ah, that's one of the most common stitches in Holland. We all learned it at school. And it's called the patent stick. Again, this word patent. And um, she showed me how to do the stitch. And she also said there are four different ways to do it. And the one that I stuck with was where you slip a stitch and give it a yarn over. And then you brioche knit. Now, you can also slip the stitch, give it a yarn over, and brioche purl. Or you can knit one, knit one below, knit one, knit one below. Or you can knit one, purl one below, knit one, purl one below. And all of these four techniques, in the end, if you make four scarves, all four scarves will look exactly the same, except that the tension will be different. Okay, so which has got the best tension, which produces the best uh, fabric, do you think? The brioche stitch, of course, <laughs> that, you, that you knit, you know, that you yeah, actually yeah. knit. Because a lot of people, their pearl is loose, so that yes. creates an even looser tension, a looser scarf, you could say, or product, whatever you're making, yeah. Okay, and just really quickly, I know that you wrote two articles on the brioche. One was back in 92 yeah. for Vogue Knitting, and one was quite a few, 10 years later or so, for Pam Allen with um, Interweave. That's right. So did that, is that what spurred you on to do further um, investigation into brioche? Or? Yeah, in 1992, uh, I wrote this article because I thought it was such an interesting stitch, and... Um, I wrote the article, I sent it in, I made a sweater, and they wrote, uh, you know, I've had a few little stitch variations, not much, and then I just sort of forgot about it. And then in 2005, Pam Allen contacted me and said that she had read that article years ago, and would I just simply write it again? And it was when I was, wrote it again that I, I tried to find historical information about the stitch and just other patterns, and there was just so little available. It was like in the 80s, it had a little bit of a revival. Yeah, a revival. And then um, after that, once again, it was just, it was all plain one color or two color brioche, but no movement with those strong uh, vertical lines. It was just simple brioche. And I thought, yeah, there's a lot more to this stitch than just that. 
Yes, and then we it led to barking and burping, oh, yeah. which is such yeah. <laughs> great terms that you created. And you also standardised the definition of all the various um, brioche techniques and stitches. And on top of that, you developed a brioche charting system, which uses symbols for every uh, brioche technique and every brioche ditch, just like a Japanese pattern. Yes. Yeah. So tell us about that. How did that come about? And then tell us... Do you feel like it has been successfully adopted by the uh, knitting community, the brioche knitting community? Well, when I wrote the first article in 1992, I wanted to, uh, to introduce this sort of new terminology. And of course, they weren't going to go for it. And I can understand it. You know, it was the only article. Why would they bring new terminology for one article? In 2005, once again, I suggested that we use new terminology and they took it on. And so from that moment on, when I started writing my books and things, um, I developed that terminolo terminology. In the very first book, which is called Knitting Brioche, I had developed the terminology and I had developed a set of symbols that I used for that book. The minute that book was done, I sort of revamped everything because it needed to be simpler. It needed to be more compact. It needed to be easier to use for the British, for the brioche community. And I also really simplified the symbols. I used symbols that they used in Japan, in the Japanese uh, charting uh, world. And I decided that it would be easier for people to read as a chart if you broke the symbol into two pieces. And so that's what I did. And you said too, you know, has it been accepted in the brioche community? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, luckily, because I do think that it does need to have its own terminology. It is its own technique and it needs to have the terminology to go with it. That's only going to make it more accessible to, to a greater audience, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Many of our viewers know that I totally love colour work, but I particularly do uh, stranded colour work, but there's a great scope and possibility in brioche knitting for colour work. But what's interesting, what you've done is you've taken the plain brioche stitch, which is worked in two colours, and you've developed it into a lot more complicated colour work. Well, you know, if you compare brioche stitch to double knitting, or even mosaic knitting. I mean, all three of those techniques, you slip stitches because that means you're going to save them for the next time you come around. And with double knitting and with uh, mosaic knitting, you carry the yarn either across the front or the back so that it's hidden. And with the brioche, what you do is you take the yarn and you carry it over the stitch that you slip. So you have a stitch that's got a little hoodie and the next time you come back to that stitch, you did it together. And that's what creates this three-dimensional cushy effect that brioche emanates. What happened when I was writing my first book is I made a scarf and it's called Herbstabend, which means uh, evening in the fall. And I made increases and decreases that uh, really showed me, or it opened up a whole world of how you change normal two-color brioche knitting. Because what happens, brioche knitting are these strong vertical columns. What happens when you increase is you take a column and you break it up into two, or you can break it up into four, you can break it up into six, you can break it up and you just have these branches coming out and your eye is very attracted to that. You know, you see those strong columns and then all of a sudden there's a movement and then you make decreases, which brings that, those stitches, those lines, it brings it all back together. They can cross, they can weave in and out. You can, you know, place them, de decreases and increases all over the chart. You can knit it up, see what you have. And that's exactly what I did. I started with a pattern, say, where the increases all stacked up and the decreases stacked up. I knit that, and while I was knitting that, I thought, well, what if I move that decrease over here and that increase over there? And I did that, and it was like, oh, wow, that really works. But there were also times where it was like, oh, wow, that really didn't work, you know, <laughs> a lot. But, uh, I mean, it, it, it just became fascinating to me. And my entire, the, the Knitting Fresh Brioche book, that second book, that entire book is nothing but stitch patterns that use two-color brioche with increases and decreases. And I mean, there's still people today that are creating their own 
uh, brioche stitch patterns that way by just making increases and decreases and placing them more or less on a chart, knitting them up and seeing what the pattern looks like. I get so excited when I hear you talking about it. I really love it when people take the craft of knitting and really explore it and push it further so it becomes into the, an art form. So I have to just give you a quick thank you for doing that. It's my job. <laughs> yeah, but it's exciting. I, I love it. I love the extreme ends of knitting. I do too. What I want to just um, talk about now, because sometimes the people get confused about the differences between brioche and double knitting and even mosaic knitting, yeah. because they're very similar in many ways. They're all reversible, they all involve slip stitches, and they have two layers. Sure. So can you give us a, a clear definition of how they differ? And then tell us, what's your personal feeling towards each of these methods as a stitch to create a garment with? I'll start with double knitting and even mosaic knitting. Those are two techniques where as you're knitting along, what you, you slip a stitch and you carry the yarn either across the back or carry across the front of the stitch so that it's hidden, the stitch, the yarn that you're carrying along. And you're slipping the stitches because you're going to save them for the next row or for the next color. It depends on some times you could carry both threads at once, but I'm just talking about we're talking one thread we're carrying it along and we're going to save those stitches for the next color to come back and then we'll work them and we'll slip the ones that we worked in the row before. And that's true with both mosaic and double knitting. Now with double knitting, you actually create a two layered fabric. You know, there's a little opening in there. You know, you've got one surface that's one color, you've got this surface that's another color, and then maybe they'll come back and kind of be worked together a little bit. But as in general, double knitting really does create two fabrics that are they're held together by where those stitches, the colors switch back and forth. With mosaic knitting, it's very similar, but uh, you have both colors in one line and they're mixed up a little bit more. And you work with knits and pearls and knits and pearls on one surface. Now with brioche knitting, you slip a stitch and when you slip it, you carry the yarn over that stitch giving that stitch a hoodie. What that means is when you come back to that stitch and hoodie, you're going to work that together, which means it's connected. There's no splitting up like in double knitting. And it's if it's light color on this side, that's the dominant color on the other side. You have the dark color being dominant as well because of the rib. It's a rib with, with knitted columns on each side, one of them in the light color. On the other side, you have the dark color. Now I've used double knitting and brioche knitting together and it works beautifully. I'll show you an example of that in a, in a minute. I have never used uh, brioche and mosaic knitting, but I have used brioche and garter stitch a lot, which also works. And you'll see some examples of that as well later on. And do you feel any of those methods are better suited for a garment um, than others or, or in combination with other stitches for a garment in particular or? These three particular techniques all have uh, drape issues, you could say. I mean, the thing about brioche knitting is it's three-dimensional and it's thermal. So if I make myself a woolen uh, brioche sweater and I put it on, I gain 40 pounds because, I mean, it's, it's thick and it's incredibly warm. Uh, for that reason, I stick to things like scarves because I love the reversibility of it and uh, shawls, hats, uh, small little scarflets, things like that. That's what I use brioche knitting for. Double knitting creates a fabric that's uh, it's actually rather stiff. There's not a lot of drape to it. And it's because you've got two layers that you're dealing with. It's not going to drape beautifully over the body. But things like coats or hats, scarves, things like that work beautifully with double knitting, my opinion, huh? Mosaic knitting is the one that's got probably the most possibility for garments, in my opinion, because it does have a great drape. It's uh, not so thick, it's not so three-dimensional, so thermal, and so it works a little bit better for uh, fabric that you're going to use for a garment. Okay, so I want to just really briefly talk about Stephen West. <laughs> he has a huge and vocal fan uh, club Very. <laughs> that's around him. Yes. 
His, uh, very, his brioche designs are very well known and greatly admired. What, one of the things that I particularly respect and admire about him is that often when he's asked about um, the technique of brioche, he brings your name up and says you were the one who taught him and he refers to you as being the real expert. <laughs> Um, and you did get to know him when he was very young, when he was still in his early 20s and you became quite friend, good friends and you were neighbours. So can you share with us just a little bit about that and, you know, tell us, for example, was it fun to teach him? Well, Stephen has been my friend for a long time. I mean, he came to Amsterdam. He moved to Amsterdam probably about seven or eight years ago and he was immediately immersed. He, he just came right into the knitting community as a young man who wasn't afraid to knit in public and um, he became a flamboyant self. I mean, he was my neighbor and uh, I mean, he wanted to come over quite often just for, you know, a home cooked meal. I mean, I had children that were his age. I have two girls that are similar in age and he would come over. Uh, we would have a nice meal. He and I would sit and knit. My kids would roll their eyes and go upstairs, but <laughs> uh, yeah, they didn't get it. It's a knitting thing, you know. And uh, yeah. no, but he's, I mean, he's one of the nicest young men I know. And like you said, he's just so generous with crediting me with having taught him. I mean, when I taught him, he went to, he came to a class. And during the class, he made uh, just the, the very small sample that I have people make that I teach, where we make uh, two color brioche, make increases, decreases. Well, he not only finished that little sample, but he started a scarf immediately because he just intuitively got it. And he saw the potential of changing colors as you go up. You've got two layers here that you're playing with. So you can go up with one color, change that one color, keep the other color going, change the color, change the color, change the color. And he made a ginormous scarf, I think, in a day because he's also an incredibly fast knitter. So uh, he just latched onto brioche really quick and he's been flying with it ever since and yeah I mean he's done that I haven't done it all I did was show him how to maneuver the threads really you got him going I got him going yeah yeah <laughs> but I'm sure the fact that you're so excited about what all the possibilities also you know fed into him as well and you know into his motivation and his creativity well he's easy to excite you know <laughs> when it comes to knitting, he'll he just latches on. He really does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. So, talking about the future of the brioche stitch, you have said that um, it's it's underdeveloped compared to other knitting techniques. So, where does it take us? What what's possible in the future? Where where are you going with it? Well, as I've explored the brioche stitch, what I've tried to do is add other knitting. You know, I I think about what are the different knitting techniques that I could use in brioche, one of them being lace. And so uh, the next book I'm going to work on is going to be brioche lace. And lace means there has to be a hole. And that hole has to make a pattern. So you can imagine a two-color brioche with, instead of increases, you would have holes. And uh, another possibility is crusted, or cables. You know, brioche yes. cables. Uh, quite a few patterns are now available using cables. And basically, it's just you take two color brioche and you cable it, just like you would do normal knitting with knits and pearls. You cable it, you cable the brioche the same way. Uh, another thing that I've been exploring is crossing brioche stitches. You've got two columns coming up. And if you cross these two columns, what you get are sort of like the twisted cross stitches that you get in Bavarian knitting, yes. except that with two color brioche, you have not only the main color of the stitch, but you have that second color. And what that second color does is it gives it a shadow. And it, these cross stitches are, they're a little tedious, but the end result is just beautiful. It really is. It's just beautiful. And then of course you also have the possibility of mixing brioche with garter stitch, with double knitting, with the linen stitch, with mosaic knitting, which I've never done. But I mean, there's there are a lot of other stitches that you can mix with brioche and come up with new patterns, come up with new, you know, techniques of using both of them. 
so that uh, you can make interesting uh, scarves, shawls, whatever. The latest thing that I'm doing, or what I'm doing right now, is I'm writing a book about tuck stitches. And brioche stitch is one of the tuck stitches. And by tuck, a tuck stitch is normally done on a machine. And what it means is you've got all these needles that hold one single stitch on each needle. And as the, the carriage just comes across, it will knit that stitch. Now, if you pull the needle so that it's not knit, it will have a yarn over. And what happens when you come back is then it will knit that stitch. It will brioche it or it will tuck it. Now, okay. on machine knitting, or what you can do is, and what you can do by hand also, is you can slip that stitch, give it a yarn over, come back to that stitch, give it another yarn over, come back to that stitch, say give it another yarn over, and then the next time you come back, you knit that all together. And so you've tucked all of those stitches and yarn overs together, causing that fabric to kind of pucker and kind of tuck together. And these tuck stitches, to me, are very sophisticated and just... You can create beautiful, beautiful patterns with tuck stitches. Yes, that sounds super exciting. And also scalloped kind of edges, I imagine, that kind of thing it would work with. Uh, the thing when you make an increase in brioche, you have to increase two. If you make a decrease, you have to decrease two. Now you can also increase four, and you can decrease four. And when you make those huge decreases and big increases, you are forcing that fabric to undulate and to scallop, like you said. And so that's just sort of an automatic freebie that you get because you've made increases and decreases. That's so exciting. <laughs> your, your latest uh, design book has got some stunning, stunning um, designs in it that look very complicated and very beautiful. So show us now and talk to us about some of those designs. I'd, I'd like to show you now some of the sort of patterns that you might not even have ever seen before. Some of these are on Ravelry, some of them aren't. Uh, this is an example, uh, this little scarflet. This is a cabled brioche stitch, meaning that this is a little bitty cable. This is a reverse stockinette brioche background. You know, normally when you make cables, you put them on a, a pearl background. Well, that's what this is, but it's in brioche. So I'm going to take this off because I'm going to show you some more. Uh, this is a scarf that I made for knitting fresh brioche, and it's mohair, which of course I am a big fan of, uh, two color brioche with increases and decreases. This uses a four stitch increase, which of course really causes the fabric to open up and really causes this undulation at the bottom of the scarf. And mohair works beautifully with two color brioche. You use a big needle, thin yarns, you're done quickly, and you get beautiful results. This scarf is called Paris Bri Paris's Brioche, and it's from the Gilmore Girls. Uh, there's a designer that already designed this scarf, but not in brioche, and I had seen this sort of stitch before in a magazine, and so I thought it needed to be in brioche. That means that it's double-sided, and these are double-knit, where this is brioche and these little... Uh, uh, teardrops are double double knit and so you get the double knit on the back as well and you get this dark side. This is Paris's brioche. That's stunning. Really gorgeous. I'm going to show you two scarves from the book Leafy Brioche. The reason it's called Leafy Brioche is of course is because I use these leaves. This leaf that I used in that green scarf I've also used here. But what I've done here is I put a double double knit stem so that on the back you get, of course, the opposite color. But this is uh, one of my favorites, absolutely one of my favorites. Now I'm going to take this off and show you another one quickly. This is a cowl, again, we're using the leaf and uh, gradated colors, yarns that gradate. And so you get yarns that gradate in color as well as the leaf more or less being de deconstructed. The leaf is destroyed as it moves in from brioche into garter stitch. That is so brilliant. It looks like it's burning up. Well, it's called uh, bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called, I have to think, yeah, it's called bonfire because, yeah, the leaves are de being destruct, or they're destructing, yes. 
This is an example of a tuck stitch. Now I know it might be rather hard to see, hopefully you'll get a, a better picture of it than what you can see from this distance. But again, it's a reversible fabric. You get two different types of stitches on each side. Not only do you get uh, two different colors acting differently on each side, but you also get a different stitch, the tuck stitch, the next future of the brioche knitting. Okay, wow. And last but not least, I wanted to show you candle flame. This is a, an afghan that's uh, knit from very thick yarn. This is a Quince and Co. yarn. But this is one of my favorite stitch patterns as well. And again, it's just two color brioche with increases and decreases. And you have this beautiful light colored side, but you also have this nice uh, dark colored side as well. That's such a lovely pattern, the way it's undulating. It is really like the movement of a candle flame, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there is a candle flame a knitted pattern just in one color, kind of lacy thing, and I just, I just, read it, I just made it in uh, brioche. Yeah. I can really see now the possibilities you know, that you can do with it. That's, that's so wonderful. Well, it has been such a privilege and such an honour to have you on our podcast and just to hear about this such exciting knitting. So I want to thank you again very deeply for giving us your time and your expertise and, yeah, for all that you've done for the brioche knitting community. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. <laughs> so we'll say goodbye to the viewers now. Bye-bye. Happy brioching. <laughs>